G'day, I'm Paul. I am very excited to drive this. It is the Mercedes-Benz EQS SUV. And I'm excited because it is the first proper ground up electric vehicle from Mercedes-Benz in an SUV trim. Prior to this, they were doing like internal combustion conversions, whereas this is just a sort of electric SUV. Now this competes with things like the Tesla Model X, the BMW iX, but it doesn't really have many other competitors that are strictly uh, ground up EVs. Now this is the 450 formatic, which means it's an all wheel drive version. It's the entry level all wheel drive. We will be getting this car in Australia. There are a number of other variants as well that I'll run you through shortly, but this is what we're test driving today. Today we're gonna do a detailed review of this car. So if you do wanna skip ahead to other parts of this video, you can use the time codes on the screen, or if you're on YouTube, you could scroll down and use the chapters below. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon because that is going to help you find out every single time we drive a ground up EV. Now before we get into the external design, let me run you through the variants that are going to be launched with EQS. So the entry level is going to be the 450, that will be just rear wheel drive. Then it goes up to the 454 Matic, which is this one here. It's all wheel drive and this is what we'll be getting in Australia. There will be a 500 as well, we'll be getting that in Australia too. And finally the range is topped out with the 580 4 Matic, that is the bee's knees. We don't know whether we'll be getting that in Australia yet, but that will be the fastest version that you can get. And there is no AMG version by the way, so they're not doing any of that stuff for this particular platform. Now, let's talk about the colours. We don't know exactly how many this is going to launch with, but if you look at the EQS sedan in Australia, it's offered with 10 exterior colours. This one here, the white, I think really suits this with the black offsets. Have a look at this grille. So similar to the BMW iX, it's all closed off there and it is an enormous grille. This one's been optioned with the Mercedes-Benz stars in here and I think this looks really cool. It's just that extra little bit of marketing that you know, doesn't go unnoticed, so I love that. Big Mercedes-Benz logo in the center here. This doubles as a radar, but also has these little elements within it for heating. So when it does snow, this will melt the snow away. You've got a camera down here for the 360 camera. I like this black treatment, but also this rose gold colored shadow chrome. That sort of runs along the bottom there and it really sort of offsets the black nicely. Down the bottom there, you've got a set of louvers for heating and cooling the battery as well. Now, depending which market you're in, you can actually get a, a glowing Mercedes-Benz logo here. I wish we got that in Australia because that looks really cool on some of these cars. You then have an LED strip that runs along the top of the bonnet there that connects these two sets of headlights. Now, speaking of headlights, this is available with digital headlights, and that means they have 1.3 million micro mirrors per headlight unit. And they can then project images out onto the road. So if you're coming up to a construction zone or roadworks, it can then notify the driver by way of projecting something onto the road so you can see it ahead. Really good innovation there and super powerful headlights as well. Now this section down here, you can get a number of different style packs on these. This is kind of a sporty look, and you can see here they've gone to town on aero. There's like a little hole in there that spits air out around the side, and that's all partly to reduce your aerodynamic drag. Now, the EQS sedan actually holds the record for the lowest coefficient of drag at 0.2, so this is obviously not going to be that low given it is uh, an SUV, but 0.2 is incredible. This won't be that much higher. It really just cuts a nice line through the air there and it reduces drag as much as possible. Now, there are a stack of innovations in this car. I'm going to try and get through as many as I can. One that I can immediately see there is a little hole there on the window. This actually works by adjusting your climate control depending on the sun position. So I'll explain that a little bit more when we get inside the car there, but that is the section that I'll be referring to when we do hop inside the car. Come around to the side here, I'll show you the wheels. So you have uh, a number of different wheels you can pick from, from 20 to 22 inches. This one here is a 21 inch wheel. You've got that chrome look on the outside with piano black on the inside. Mercedes-Benz even went to the effort of creating aerodynamic alloys as well because you can shave a little bit of drag off the car by making sure your alloys are nice and slick as the air runs over them. Everything about this car is about getting a little bit of extra range by just improving aerodynamics wherever you can. Under there you've got a set of air suspension with adaptive damping. Given this is a Benz I'm hoping that means it rides really nicely because I want it to be plush and nice to sit inside as opposed to sporty and rough. Um, up here this looks interesting doesn't it? So when you crack that open this is actually the hole for the windscreen wiper fluid. The reason it's here is because this doesn't open, it doesn't have a frunk. Under here you have an enormous HEPA filter and inside the cabin you can actually monitor the airflow and the air quality as you're driving. So that means this is where you're going to fill your wiper fluid. 
Then in addition to that, EQS up the top here, just so you don't forget what you're driving. They're working on an EQE SUV, so obviously that will say EQE when that is launched, and there's probably going to be something beneath that as well. Uh, over here on the wing mirror, you've got piano black up the top there, indicator built into there, camera on the side, and an LED light there as well. Another part of the aero that they've worked on is down the side here. So this car doesn't have it, but you can option running boards. And while they help you get in and out of the car, they actually work to reduce the drag as well. So they've thought of every little bit here along the way. The door handles are really cool as well. So they look perfectly normal, but behind there, you actually have an LED that lights up the door handle. You have a chrome section along the top there. And then to get inside the car, all you do is wipe your hand there and then it pops out. You can see Mercedes-Benz written on there as well. And then to open the door, you simply pull on that door handle and then it cracks open. Piano black up the top there along the bottom rail there as well. You have privacy glass up the top there. And before we jump around to the back, this has four wheel steering and it can turn up to 10 degrees on the rear axle, which reduces the turning circle immensely. I'll demo that a little bit later on so you can see how it works. But yeah, this is making sure that you can drive this in and around the city without it feeling like a big bus. Come around to the back. Now, how big is this, I hear you asking? Um, it is slightly smaller than a GLS in terms of size, and it's also shorter than the EQS sedan. In terms of actual dimensions, it sits on a wheelbase that's just over three meters long. It's a little over five meters long, just under two meters wide, and a little over 1.7 meters tall. And you can also adjust the ride with the air suspension by jacking it up into an off-road mode that increases the ground clearance too. Now, in terms of the air, I have a look at this. They've added this section. So as air comes along here, there's a little flick there to stop turbulence building at the back of the car. So this is helping reduce that drag as well. These tail lights are full LED, but they have a 3D element in them and they're frosted as well. So they really do look fantastic at nighttime. EQS 450. And then over here, you have a 4Matic badge because this is all wheel drive. You crack the boot open by pushing the Mercedes Benz logo just there. Down here, you've got piano black and then a little bit of this sort of fake exhaust built into there as well. So let me know what you reckon about the design. Do you think the EQS SUV looks good? I'm keen for your feedback. So let me know in the comments section below. So we are inside the EQS SUV. Uh, we'll start off with the key. So here it is, you've got lock up the top, unlock boot. It's got this beautiful metal surround and then on the back, it's blank. This is a proximity sensing key, so you can leave that in your pocket. Grab the door handle. Once you're inside, your start button is just here. So the design, this is full on. So this is the first time I've sat in an EQS and this one has the hyper screen, which I'll run you through shortly. But this is really just out there in terms of the way that it looks. When you consider the price that this car is going to be when it does finally arrive in Australia, it's going to be expensive, but this looks and feels like it's worth every single dollar of whatever they want to charge for it. So really nice setup. When you don't have the hyper screen there, it is a slightly different design, but that still looks nice and premium too. Um, I like these finishes here. So you have wood grain on the center there. You've got these uh, finishes along the top of the dash there as well, all the way around. Love these LEDs as well that change color depending on what you're doing. The interesting thing as well is Mercedes-Benz says that they now are able to offer an animal-free interior, including the steering wheel. So that is an option if, uh, if that concerns you. Uh, so they sort of cover all bases there in terms of design and also what the interior looks like. Um, now, what about uh, touch points, I guess? Um, so all that stuff's nice, really nice there in the center and soft on the door as well. How soft are they though? Well, we've got our gyrometer. We've tested the main surfaces in this cabin. If you want to see how this car compares to others that we've tested before, have a look at the link in the description below. Build quality. I've been having a bit of a play with this today and it is all very nice and solid. And what about our door? Yeah, nice. It sounds very nice and solid as well. Now, moving on to infotainment. This is probably the thing I'm most excited to talk to you about because this hyper screen is insane. I've never seen anything like this in a car and the way that they've integrated it is really cool as well. So we'll start off with the center screen. So this is almost 18 inches in size. It is absolutely enormous. It runs basically from there all the way down to there. And in fact, the screen runs from here all the way to the other side of the car. So these two screens are OLED, whereas this one here is LCD ahead of the driver. These two also have haptic feedback. So when you are uh, moving around and then clicking, you can actually feel a response through your finger as well, which I think is um, really cool and just something a little bit different. It also has force feedback. So the harder you push, 
uh, it's able to then do different functions within that um, actual infotainment system. The other thing they've also implemented here as well is what they call a zero layer design. And that means that all of your critical functions are on that display to begin with. You don't have to dive through menus. And I think that's really handy because previously with MBUX, it has been a little bit confusing having to go back through menus to access things. Whereas here, it's all very logical and there in front of you. Now, before I run through some of the actual functions, I want to talk about the actual display itself. This is actually molded at 650 degrees and there's a top layer on that glass that is uh, there specifically for fingerprints. And at the moment, I can't see any fingerprints on the screen at all and we've been playing around a lot with that. So that actually works, which is good news. And I wanna run you through as well the computing power here because when I saw these specs, my head literally almost flew off. This is more powerful than some gaming PCs. So 24 gigabytes of RAM. It has eight CPU cores. And in terms of processing power, 46.4 gigabytes per second. Like, it is just incredible. And that's what you need to run some of the functions that the car actually needs to operate. So located in here, you have satellite navigation that's just built into that display. Um, this works pretty well. We've got it on a satellite overview at the moment. And then as you move around, it will sort of shift with it. It can be a little bit laggy at times, I've noticed, if it has to preload content once it is loaded. It works okay, but you can see there um, that it is sort of pretty quick. And in addition to that on the audio front, you have AM, FM, DAB, digital radio. You also have online radio streaming, and it's all plumbed through a 15-speaker Burmester sound system. This also has 3D surround sound with Dolby Atmos. So it is a pretty full-on sound system. I don't know where you would ever need to use 3D surround sound, maybe if you went to the drive-in movies or something, but um, yeah, it's pretty cool to see that it has all of that processing power. Then on the smartphone mirroring front, you have both Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Both of those are wireless. I'll show you what Apple CarPlay looks like. Look at that. That is like the world's biggest Apple CarPlay display. Holy moly. That is enormous. Absolutely enormous. Let's see what the maps look like. <laughs> that is unreal. I love that. Um, and this is what Android Auto looks like. So again, uh, full screen integration. When you do dive into maps, it then uh, holds that menu for you as well. So yeah, pretty impressive here in terms of that central display and the mirroring features. Um, other sort of curious things that you can actually do here, uh, this is also where you can control the other screens inside the car. You can also uh, basically tell the car what you want displayed on the other screens. So we have screens in the back, the passenger screen as well. Uh, so this is kind of like the, the hub for all that. And this is also where you can set other things and also download apps to the car. So you can see here there's a beginner driver mode, valet service mode. These are all things that allow you to restrict certain functions of the car depending on who's accessing it. So if you've got your kids driving it, you don't want them doing skids and all that sort of stuff, you could set all that up in there. Same story with valet. They won't be able to see your previous contacts and other uh, private information. You have a web browser built into here. You also have connectivity with Mercedes Me. So that is the application that allows you to connect into the car. This actually works really well and they've enhanced this massively. So you can see here, this allows you to virtually just manage all of the functions in the car, lock, unlock, charging status. You can find where your nearest charges are. You can also set things like those valet modes, do over the air updates really is quite sophisticated. And just on the topic of over-the-air updates as well, Mercedes-Benz is working on bringing extra functions to these cars. So that includes things like 10 degrees of turn on the rear axle. They'll be able to update that. They'll be able to send you other functions for the car and also the infotainment system over time as well. So good to see they're getting on board that, um, that train as well. Uh, what else can I show you here on the central display? Um, yeah, look, when we go for a drive, I'll run you through some of the actual EV functions, but this is really comprehensive, and I love that they've put so much effort into this. It's not just a gimmick. It's not a huge screen just for the sake of having a huge screen. It is really good to use, and uh, I'm a big fan of that. Um, let's jump over to the screen ahead of the driver here. So 12.3-inch display. This is quite similar to the other Mercedes-Benz vehicles we've reviewed before, so you can change the look of that display and the theme. Uh, pretty sort of easily. And then in addition to that, you can adjust things like your augmented reality on the head-up display ahead of the driver, uh, things like speed limit signs and everything. You can adjust exactly what it looks like um, ahead of the driver as well. So it is just full on there in terms of what you can do. Um, let's jump over now to the passenger side display. So this is also a 12.3 inch display. Now the reason the camera angle is so weird is Sean is actually in the car now. You have to be sitting there for this to work. Um, so we'll switch that on. So you can see here it kind of mirrors the main 
display, you can then adjust what you want loaded onto that display. So you can have images, you can go through all of the vehicle settings there as well, should you so desire. Uh, it is sort of quite comprehensive. In addition to that, you can also display different images there. So depending on what you want it to show, if you don't really want any of the interactive stuff, all you do is set the display to have a uh, passenger screen decorative image. You can just then switch to different images there as well instead of having the actual active display. Now you can also play video over here and the cool thing is if you do decide to play video or watch some television, if the driver puts their eyes on the screen to watch as well, it has a two second timeout. Once you hit the two seconds, it will basically stop the screen from displaying anything. It's actually a set of cameras up here and when you do glance over here, it'll give you two seconds before it switches that screen off entirely. But I hear you asking, how does it know whether you're looking at the screen or the actual wing mirror? Well, the cameras are able to use the angle of your face in relation to the seat position to see when you are looking at the mirrors, and it will just ignore the fact that there's something playing here. So it is some incredible technology here. And look, will passenger side screens take off? I don't know, but I think it is pretty cool that this stuff exists. And the fact that you can listen to audio from that in headphones or separate to the driver, I think is pretty cool. Now, safety technology, as you can imagine, this thing is jam-packed full of safety gear. So you have autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian and cyclist detection. You have an auto dimming rear vision mirror there, sort of nice and sleek as well. In addition to that, you have blind spot monitoring built into the wing mirror, rear cross traffic alert, front cross traffic alert. You have radar cruise control with uh, lane keeping assistant, lane departure warning, semi-autonomous steering function. One of the other things they've talked about bringing in as an over the air update is level four autonomy for car parks and other bits and pieces, which is pretty cool. Um, on the parking front, you have both front and rear parking sensors and a 360 camera. I will show you what that looks like. It's actually surprisingly good. Like it's quite high resolution around the edges there. And then what you can do is whip the camera around as you go just to see what you're near. And then you have these presets as well. So you've got curb cam on both sides. Then you can go wide on the rear and then even super wide as well if you want. You can see our suitcase there pretty clearly front view as well again wide and super wide so yeah pretty impressive camera setup there on the parking assistance front let's have a look at that um, this has like a semi-autonomous parking function so it shows up here but it also shows up here on the screen when you come to a spot where it can then automatically park for you so yeah pretty impressive camera and parking sensor setup Moving on to practicality, and we'll start off with your connectivity. So behind here, you have two USB-C slots. You have a wireless phone charger. Down the bottom here, you've got another two USB-C slots. In the center console here, you've got another two USB-C slots. So you have stacks of connectivity within the car. Hidden under there is a 12 volt outlet. In terms of storing your phone, where's it gonna live? Well, you can whack it down there on the wireless phone charger, or literally you've got a litany of other places to put that, which is really cool. Bottle storage, it lives in here, and you can also fit it inside the door without any problems. This has teeth in there as well. You can also get rid of those uh, cup holders too, should you so desire. Now, the interesting thing as well is the coffee cup. So because we are in the States, I thought, well, let's just use a American Paul size coffee cup. And as you can see, that kind of fits in perfectly as well. Now, what about your other storage? So you've got storage room in there, this center console is huge and it's really nice and deep as well. They are fully utilizing the uh, maximum space they can with this EV platform. Down here, you've got even more storage. And finally, you have a glove box over here. Glove box is not all that big, but it is okay. But um, yeah, I am pretty impressed here how they've been able to package everything and give you as much storage as humanly possible. Let's talk about comfort now. So you have quad zone automatic climate control. So two zones for the front here, two for the second row. Front seat also comes with heating and cooling for the seats and the steering wheel. You have this enormous HEPA filter, which is what exists under the bonnet there, which is why you can't open it. Uh, and I love the fact that when all this stuff is on, you actually get a reading both inside and outside the car in terms of the air quality, which I think is, is quite fascinating. Now, I did touch on this very briefly early on when we were talking about outside the car, but those sensors down the front there, they're actually there to help distribute flow around the car. And we'll see if they actually work when we go for a drive later. And when I say flow, I mean climate flow. They're designed to basically pick up where the sun is sitting, the temperature outside, the temperature inside, and then adjust airflow as required. Often, if you are driving into the sun and you change direction, it can sometimes adjust what it feels like inside the car. So we'll see if that stuff actually works. I'm excited to test that out. 
Now, what about your seats? Oh, they are so comfy. So they hug you in nicely. You've even got this amazing sort of headrest here. I think when level four autonomy comes around and you can have a bit of a kit behind the wheel, that's gonna be pretty awesome. Uh, you have full electric seat adjustment for the driver and front passenger, so you can go forwards, backwards. You can extend this bottom section forwards and backwards. You can move the backrest forwards, backwards, lift the base at the back or the front, and then you also have electric adjustment of the headrest as well. Ah, so good. Um, in addition to that, you have seat memory for both the driver and front passenger. Steering wheel is electrically adjustable for both tilt and reach. And then on our reach test, all of this stuff is easy to reach while you're driving, but the good news is you have a great voice recognition system that will pick up virtually anything you can't actually reach while you're driving. So second row of the EQS SUV, have a look at this. I have stacks of room. So knee room is excellent. Toe room is fantastic. Headroom is pretty good as well. There is a surprising amount of space back here. Flat floor, thank goodness. I remember the, that was the EQC uh, that was sort of based on the GLC platform had that weird hump there. This is all entirely flat. So maximizing use of as much space as possible. In terms of the features that you have here, so this car has the optional rear entertainment system. So both of these are touch screens and then you can basically get whatever you want to appear on here. In addition to all of that down here, you have a set of USB-C ports and HDMI as well if you do want to watch any video. Um, over on the doors is where you'll find your adjustments for the seat and also seat heaters. So here you can push that row forwards and backwards and then also tilt the backrest as well should you so desire. Air vents here and also here as well. And in addition to those air vents, this is where you control your climate for the second row. Have a look at these LEDs that are built into the roof. They're pretty cool. Set of dual pane sunroof there with its own cover that comes across. Have a look at this center armrest though. I think this is pretty cool. So here you have your own tablet. You can eject this and if you can't be bothered using the touch screen, you can then actually configure all of your screen settings on here and then switch between the screens as required. Storage here in the center, that's also where you're going to find a wireless phone charger. Set of cup holders here as well, easily fit the bottle there without any dramas at all. Children, if you have some of those, in terms of seating, you have isofix points on the two outboard seats with three top tether points. And what about our window test? So it's auto up and down, boom, goes all the way down. Very impressive there from Mercedes-Benz. Okay, so third row, what's it like? How easy is it to get in? And is it for adults? Only one way to find out. So the second row moves electrically out of the way. And I love the fact that it actually moves the front seat out of the way as well, which means it's much easier to climb into the back. So let me give this a shot now. We'll see how it goes. Okay, so I am in, let's have a look at headroom first. Yeah, headroom's okay. It is kind of just wedged into there. Um, so with one click of the button on top of the seat, it brings it back into a first position. And then once it's in that position, I can manually then keep bringing it back to the point where my knees are jammed in there. So look, that's probably about as far back as I'd want to go. So headroom is pretty compromised. My knees are kind of into that seat now as well. Toe room is pretty good though. In terms of creature comforts, you do have heated seats here for the third row. You've also got an air vent just here. You've got storage off to the sides there with another set of two USB-C ports, which is great. Look, I think as an adult, you could probably fit in here for a short to medium term drive. It wouldn't be the end of the world, but um, you wouldn't want to be in here for too long. Uh, but look, I think it's fine and kids are going to enjoy it back here as well. Now let's talk about cargo volume. So you open the boot by pushing on the Mercedes Benz logo. Now, this has a number of different configurations and spaces depending on whether you go for seven seats or without your seven seats. If you do go for the five seat option, you have a little over 600 litres of cargo space with the third row folded. If you go for the seven seat option though, it is a little under 600 litres of cargo space. Now, before I show you the room in the back here, under the cargo floor here, you have room for the cargo blind. I would have loved to see maybe a much deeper floor here. If you think about stuff like Tesla Model Y, for example, you can actually just have so much stored in here. With this, it's kind of a little bit limited, which is a little disappointing given it is an entirely EV platform. In terms of our storage space, let's try our suitcase in here. I wonder if that'll close actually. Let's see what happens. Hopefully it does. Oh no, it doesn't close. Okay, so it doesn't fit a mid-sized suitcase in there behind the third row. Let me clear the third row out of the way though. So push this down to drop the headrests 
and then you have to manually move this out of the way, which I think is a little bit disappointing. It would have been nice to see an electric third row adjustment here. So with that out of the way, we can drop our suitcase in and I'll grab my laptop bag as well. Pop that in next to it. So there you go, you have stacks of room once the third row is out of the way. Then what you can also do is drop the second row. That is electrically adjustable, so you can just flick these two here and then the seats will disappear out of the way there. Once they do disappear out of the way, if you are in five seat configuration, you have 2,100 litres of cargo space in seven seat configuration, it's a little over 2,000 litres. And it is worth pointing out as well that you have a 12 volt outlet just off to the side here as well. Now, before we go for a drive, I wanna show you this. So this is the charging port and it's gonna come with a number of different options depending on what you wanna spec. So you have both AC and DC charging. Here for the States, you have a different type of charging plug, but in Australia, it will be a type two plug and a CCS type two combo plug. It comes standard with 11 kilowatt of AC charging, but you can get the optional 22 kilowatt three phase charger. So that will put a little bit more juice into the battery. The battery is big. It's about 110 kilowatt hours. So it is a mammoth battery. And in terms of the DC charging capacity, it will run it up to 200 kilowatts and it will sustain that for quite a long time as well. So it does mean that this will be quite a quick charge when it comes to it. It is on 400 volt architecture. They haven't gone to 800 volt like some other brands, uh, but they think that this is the way to go. So um, yeah, look, this all looks pretty good to me and uh, nothing sort of too out of the ordinary here. So I've just hit the road in the EQS SUV. I know I keep saying this whenever we review electric cars, but damn, this is so quiet in here. And I don't know, I think this is the big difference with uh, brands like Mercedes-Benz now sort of fully getting into EVs and this being on a dedicated EV platform. It's going to mean that we'll see big advancements in terms of refinement and stuff that we kind of haven't seen yet in the EV space. So um, that is a big bonus. So right now we're driving the EQS SUV, the 450. So it's the entry level all wheel drive version. This is the car that we're going to be getting in Australia. And at this stage, um, I think that this is going to be a really good stopping point for someone who doesn't want all of that ultra performance, but still wants a bit of punch behind the wheel. So this uses two electric motors, one on the front axle, one on the rear axle. So it produces 265 kilowatts of power as a peak with those two motors and 800 Newton meters of torque. Now, what does all that feel like behind the wheel? We'll see if this does all of our fun EV stuff. We'll give that a punch, yep. <laughs> Can confirm it does, it really sort of pins you back in the seat. And look, I think that's what you come to expect with these EVs, and you've got to consider with this car, it has an enormous battery. It means that it is big and heavy as well. So when we go for a bit more of a spirited drive, I'm keen to see what it feels like, but it is good to see that it does have that poke behind the wheel. Now, in terms of the other specs that are available for EQS, if you are watching this outside of Australia, you have the 450 entry level, which is just rear wheel drive. You've got a 500, which is a formatic all wheel drive version. And then the top spec is the 580, which is uh, you know the, the powerhouse. Um, we'll put the numbers up on the screen because it'll be a little bit too confusing if I run through everything. But as you can see, having almost a thousand Newton meters of torque means that this thing will absolutely not dawdle. And that is kind of regardless of which uh, variant of the EQS SUV you go for. Now there is something fascinating that goes on here with the all wheel drive system. They actually decouple the front axle regularly. And, and the other thing we noticed as well, at low speeds, they'll also actually operate it as a front wheel drive if they need to. So depending on which situation is going to be the most efficient, they're basically taking the approach that we will then use that set of motors. So in some instances, you might have better rolling resistance from uh, the front axle compared to the rear axle. Uh, it might be more efficient to accelerate with the rear axle, so they will pick those as they go. And it means that when you are just cruising along, typically this is only powering two wheels. Now that is important in an EV because you can do that instantaneously. It's not like a, an internal combustion car where you have to have a clutch pack or you have to always have one of the axles spinning up to have instant torque. Because this is a fully electric system, everything is always available immediately or alternatively, you can switch it off and have it re-engage immediately as well. And you really don't feel anything behind the wheel. When you go for the throttle, it just hits you in the back. There is no delay. Everything happens just as you would expect it to happen in a, in a product that has zero lag. Now let's talk about our regen mode. So 
Got a number here to pick from. Um, I'll start off with normal recuperation. When I roll out of the throttle, it starts sort of slowing down gradually. If I do want to increase the recuperation, I can use the paddle shifter here on the steering wheel to go to strong recuperation. That slows the car right down, but it won't bring it to a complete stop. Once we get to a lower speed, it will then eventually just sort of roll, at, roll along sort of a, at, a, at a sort of constant pace. You can then go to no recuperation, and that means if you do let out of the throttle, it just coasts and you're not sort of getting energy back into the battery pack. They do have one final mode here, which is intelligent recuperation. What that does is it uses the GPS to see where you're driving. But in addition to that, it can also bring the car to a stop if you're approaching an intersection and the Distronic, the radar system, has detected a car stopped ahead of you. Look, in theory, it makes sense, but we did test it out a little bit when we left uh, sort of Denver downtown. and. It didn't really work that well. It sort of didn't really pick up cars until the last second. And then the other problem is if you're coming up to a red light where there aren't any cars stopped, such as you being the first to approach, it's kind of a bit pointless because it won't come to a stop. Whereas something like a Nissan Leaf or a Tesla or even the Hyundai Ioniq 5 and the Kia EV6, they will do a traditional uh, single pedal driving mode where it will come to a complete stop regardless of what's ahead of you. So I think that is probably a better option and hopefully that's something they can deploy with an over the air update. And just also on that with brake pedal feel, did notice here when we are in the strong recuperation mode, the brake pedal is actually um, actuating on its own. And in the other EVs I've tested, that doesn't actually happen until the car comes to a full stop if you are in a single pedal driving mode. And here I'm finding it a little unnerving because if I roll out of the throttle and go to the brake, it's in the process of pushing the brake. And then when you go for the brake pedal, the pedal is really hard. So it does have that stopping confidence, but you really have to dive onto the brake pedal. And yeah, it just doesn't really sort of um, fill you with confidence when you hit it for the first time. Now, what's the ride like? It is absolutely sensational. So depending on the country and the spec and stuff like that, you can get this with air suspension and that's what we have in the car today. And that air suspension comes with adaptive damping as well. And Mercedes-Benz, they're known for having a ride that is sensational regardless of the type of road that you're on. And this is no exception to that, to that rule. It really is nice and smooth. When you hit potholes, bumps, you don't feel anything coming through the cabin. It's all isolated within the body. Um, and it also has an off-road mode. Later on, we'll do a tiny bit of off-road driving. I'll show you what that looks like. But in the off-road mode, you can jack the suspension up by about 25 millimeters, and that will give you that extra clearance if you do want to do any light off-roading. Now, let me point out something else cool here inside the cabin. It comes with augmented reality for the navigation. And we have seen this before in Mercedes-Benz products, but I think the implementation here is sensational. So on the head-up display, that display is 77 inches in diameter when it's projected onto the road ahead of the driver. So it is enormous. Uh, in addition to that, on the central display here, the augmented reality actually overlays a camera image of what's coming up and then gives you arrows telling you where you need to go. And the other amazing feature as well, and I have no idea how this works, on the head-up display, it tells you which lane you're in. So normally a head-up display will tell you, okay, you need to turn off soon. This will actually tell you which lane you're in and then which lane you need to be in to make the next turn. So it is pretty awesome technology that's fitted here as standard. Now, I did mention when we were outside the car, all the sensors and stuff for the climate control, it is working remarkably well. So as we're going down this mountain and going through switchbacks and stuff, you can actually feel that the cabin just feels really nice. There's no requirement for me to touch any of the controls. It actually just feels really nice and calm in here. So um, the system definitely works. Uh, I know that it won't work for my wife though, because regardless of what the temperature is, she always wants it to be like a polar blast on her face. Uh, it's just, I don't know, she's a strange person. So, um, But yeah, it seems to work well here for normal people like me. Right, let's talk drive modes super quickly. So you activate them here on this sort of lower section and you can choose between off-road, eco, comfort, sport and individual. Let's pop it into sport. We'll go for a little fang up here and see what it feels like. Okay, so let's get stuck into this. So immediately I can feel there's a whole lot more acceleration there. It's a whole lot, uh, whole lot more eager to sort of get up and moving. Still not loving that brake pedal feel. It's sort of um, yeah, it doesn't really inspire much confidence. I can jump on the pedal, but then it's, yeah, not very confidence inspiring. Um, but in terms of the body, it's, um, it's actually sitting nice and flat. So you've got anti-roll mitigation here 
and it's, um, it's actually working really well. As the body tips in, you can sort of feel it hunkering down the other side of the car and then you can just punch it out of a corner and it sort of has that, um, has that sort of confidence inspiring feel as you sort of tuck it in, especially with those rear wheels assisting you with the turning. You can really dive into these tight corners and it sort of just, just does its job really well. So it is a good sort of electronic torque vectoring system. On the tighter stuff too, it is surprising how something this size can actually feel nimble behind the wheel. So yeah, look, it's, um, it's actually pretty impressive. I wasn't expecting something this big to be as, uh, as nimble or agile as it is. It actually does a really good job of just hunkering down and giving you that confidence behind the wheel. Now let's talk zero to 100. So we stuck it up against our V-Box and we came back with 5.6 seconds, which isn't too bad for a vehicle this size and also isn't too bad given that this is going to be the entry level variant in Australia. Let's talk about visibility. So this is a big vehicle. Yes, it is slightly smaller than the EQS sedan, but it does still feel big here behind the wheel. And look, it's not such a bad thing. I don't actually feel like it is it is too big. So I can clearly see down the front corners there. Uh, visibility out the back isn't too bad. Keep in mind though, if you do have your third row deployed, visibility will be a little limited there. Uh, visibility out the sides is fine as well. Those wing mirrors are big enough and they have blind spot monitors built into those. And then when you are parking, I mean, it has a litany of parking sensors and a litany of cameras to make sure you don't nudge or hit anything while you are driving. Now, what about towing? So if you do want to do any towing, it comes with an 1800 kilogram braked towing capacity. Um, and the other cool thing as well, just on turning circle, it can pull the wheels in by 10 degrees on the rear axle. And that means you can do the tightest U-turns known to man. Today we had to do one in a street and I thought I was gonna to have to do a three point turn, but it literally just tucked itself in and did this remarkable U-turn. So that's something Mercedes-Benz is gonna be deploying as part of an over there update. So standard, I think it's around four degrees of turn in for the rear axle, and then they'll put out that over the air update that allows you to go up to 10 if you want, which is pretty impressive. And that means you're basically reducing turning circle from around 12 meters to 11 meters, which I think is, is pretty impressive. Now let's quickly talk about off-road. I mentioned in the drive modes there is an off-road button. Uh, as part of the launch, they actually have an off-road course set up for us. Um, I don't have high hopes, to be honest, to see how you know a luxury SUV is going to perform off-road, but we'll see how it goes anyway. Um, they've actually set up different cars specifically for off-road, so we're going to switch into one of those and see how it performs. So we are now on the off-road course. Um, what I'll do here is just run you through some of the sections that we're doing uh, and we'll just sort of jump between them because it's such a long course I probably won't have enough to talk about the whole time. Um, yeah, one of the benefits here when you are in off-road, it jacks the suspension up by 25 mil. Depending on the market, it can go a little higher as well. And one of the other benefits of an electric car off-road is that you have instant torque at the wheels. You have better ability to do torque vectoring and it means that the traction control systems don't have to work as hard when you get surges of torque going to the wheels. I love also the camera view as well because at the moment we have this steep climb. Uh, it's a 30% grade. I can't see over the front of the car, but with the camera view, I can see pretty much exactly what's happening ahead of me. So um, yeah, I think that is a, a pretty cool setup. Right, so we're approaching a section now where um, the rear wheel steering is actually gonna come in handy because it is a super, super tight turn. Um, but just before we sort of arrive to there, it's quite rocky along here. It's actually pretty impressive how smooth and comfortable this is, given how rocky and rough this terrain is. Uh, the air suspension is actually leveling it out really nicely. So this tight turn here, there is no way you would be able to do this in <laughs> most cars because it's a tight turn and then a climb through these trees. But because we have that steering angle on the rear axle, it's actually letting us tuck it in really nicely there and then you just lean on the throttle out of here and it just really easily gets in there. So yeah, so impressed with this. And this is also great as well because we're trying to get through these trees here. And again, I can't really see much, but the camera is showing us sort of exactly where we're going so we don't rip the front end off <laughs> this new car. 
So we've got a long climb here. It's like a 30% grade, which is almost 20 degrees. To put that into context, um, if you watch some of our other videos where we do off-roading, we're climbing a 25 degree climb. So it is pretty steep here. And one of the things that the Benz guys have done to these cars, they're standard outside of the tires and the tires on these are kind of like a, pretty much a mud terrain, all terrain tire. Um, they're quite sort of chunky and that's to prevent the sidewalls from, from breaking open with these rocks because they are quite sharp. But in saying that, it is actually really impressive how well it's handling uh, the, the limited traction we have climbing up here because you've got a steep climb with loose, loose gravel and then rocky areas as well. And sometimes you do see traction control light flashing here, but you always have torque available to you. So uh, I am keen to see when we get to this mogul they've got set up how it actually performs once we get a wheel off the ground because typically with some of the dual cab utes that we test you have to have a locking rear diff to actually get over moguls because once a wheel is in the air it just free spins and traction control generally isn't enough to get it across so we'll see how it goes. So this bit here that we're coming up to is it's a little bit technical because it goes it's a steep right hand turn with a drop off that leads down to our mogul so I just want to make sure I get this set up right. I've got Charlie, my co-driver here. Are you happy for me to turn in now? Yep, okay. <laughs> We're basically just gonna let the car drop in here. <laughs> wow. It is, um, yeah, that is some, some serious terrain there because literally had a wheel off the ground there as it was descending. And it's weird with the regen <laughs> in the mode that it's in i'm able to ride the brake and it's it's then using a mix of engine braking with regen as it goes down so you're always you're always slowing down a little bit without having to do anything which i think is pretty cool um, next up we have our mogul so i'm just going to set up for this and i'll do what we do with all of our dual cab utes as well which is basically dropping it into the mogul we'll let it settle for a bit and just see how it goes in terms of um, traction the offset mogul. Uh, this is way steeper than the one we have at home, so I'm <laughs> keen to see how this goes. But I'll drop this in so we get that rear tire off the ground. So there it is there. And right now, all I'm doing is just leaning on the throttle as it comes through. And it's doing a remarkably good job here with the stability control. It's just managing all of it. And that's the benefit you have with two electric motors because it can just send torque wherever it needs to go. We've got the front wheel off the ground now. I'll just roll back into the throttle as we drop into this part of the mogul. <laughs> that is seriously good. I'm so impressed with that. I think when we get to the point where electric vehicles are off-road ready and capable like this is, we're going to see just off-roading become a much easier task because the electric motors will just manage everything for you and you just jump in the car, lean on the throttle and away you go. So it is a pretty impressive setup. So we're wrapping up um, the off-road course and the last thing we're going to try here is the hill descent control. Um, the cool thing is you can actually adjust the speed. So you can see there, if I adjust my cruise control lever, I can go up and down in terms of the speed and then that controls the way the car handles this terrain. Um, I've said this before in uh, off-road videos that I prefer to do the sort of descent myself, but here in an electric vehicle, it actually kind of works okay because you're, you're not really just using brakes, you're using, I guess, engine braking in some instances. So it has better control over the ability to slow down as opposed to some vehicles that are just sort of uh, grabbing at the brakes over time. And then that means if, if the train is very wet and loose, it can sort of send you a little further than you want to. So yeah, it seems to work well. So look, I've been pretty impressed with this from an off-road perspective. I definitely was not expecting it to be, uh, I guess, this capable off-road, given it is a luxury SUV. And it does make me excited for, for electric off-road vehicles to arrive because I think that they'll be able to get really creative with torque control and, and just managing traction without having to have mechanical uh, differential locks and things like that. So yeah, pretty cool setup here in the EQS SUV. So the Mercedes-Benz EQS SUV, I'm really looking forward to getting this back to Australia to see what it's like on our roads because I've been pretty impressed with it here and also impressed with it off-road. I really wasn't expecting it to be that capable and I think that if you are buying one of these as a family, it means you can go do a bit of light off-roading, going camping and stuff like that and not be too concerned about this getting stuck just because it is an electric vehicle. Um, in terms of the things I didn't like, I wasn't a huge fan of the brake pedal feel. 
I think ultimately that kind of lets it down a little bit and I'm hoping they can fix that over time either with software updates. Um, I just think that it just needs to be a little bit more progressive. But outside of that, this has more than enough punch for what will be the entry level model in Australia and it is super luxurious inside and so smooth as well. So it is like the ultimate luxury electric SUV. Um, now, let me know what you think about it in the comments section below. And if you did enjoy this video, please make sure you like it and you share it with your mates. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon. But until next time, see you later.